This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Welcome to this evening's session on uh, unmanned aerial vehicles and ethics. Uh, this promises, I mean, you can see from the number of people in the, in the room, this is a topic of great interest to a lot of people in San Diego. San Diego is privileged to be in a position where uh, it, is, uh, it has major involvement in the shaping of UAV programs, and uh, we are fortunate to have three um, excellent speakers for t uh, this evening's program. Uh, my name is Larry Hinman. I'm a professor of philosophy at the University of San Diego. I know that seems a long way from drones, except <laughs> my students might say something about droning on. I don't know. Uh, but overall, um, the, 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 most of my research is in uh, ethical issues uh, at the frontiers of science. And so I do a lot about robotics and um, neuroscience and, and other areas. So, uh, and I was involved for several years in the formation and uh, beginning years of the Center for Ethics and Science and Technology. One of the things I eventually did as I look forward uh, to retirement uh, is uh, I sort of absolved myself of all administrative roles and was able to step back and just teach, write, and get into trouble in various other ways. So, um, but it's a pleasure to be back here as moderator for this evening. Um, let me uh, briefly introduce each of our three speakers for this evening, uh, and I'll begin and I'll introduce them in the order in which they will speak. Uh, Lucian Miller is CEO of uh, Innovative Designs in Vista, um, and th his company distributes electrical power systems for use in radio-controlled model aircraft, helicopters, and small UAVs. Uh, it also manufactures and distributes. Uh, multi robot or uh, multi rotor, rotor UAVs you know the the quads and other things you uh, he'll be able to give me the proper yes yeah, oh you see some of those at at the back of the table there um, I was telling uh, Lucien earlier today that I'm trying to restrain myself from going and buying one uh, I have absolutely no good reason but you know they're they're absolutely fascinating, compelling to me. Well, I do have one good reason not to, and that. It's my wife. So, um, so Lucien will uh, lead off this evening's uh, comments, uh, followed by Keith McClellan, uh, who's CEO of ROV Systems uh, and is joining us uh, this evening from Lake Havasu, Arizona. Um, and he too is involved in the development of a number of innovative uh, unmanned platforms purely for commercial use. And he is a 35-year um, uh, aviation veteran and um, uh, has extensive experience as a pilot and um, is, uh, knows whereof he speaks. And finally, the, our third speaker this evening will be um, retired Commander Bob Osborne, uh, who served with the LA uh, County Sheriff's Department for 38 years uh, before his retirement and transition transition now uh, to reserve deputy status as of October of 2012. Um, and he began working on the acquisition and use of un, uh, unmanned aerial uh, systems in 2008. And he's currently a member of the Department of Homeland Security, Robotic Aircraft for Public Safety Steering Committee, um, and is on the forefront of a number of these dis uh, discussions, including the regular discussions, which I think all three of our panelists are uh, closely involved with. So um, 
you know, one of the things that the Center for Ethics and Science and Technology is committed to is the thoughtful discussion of difficult ethical issues. One of the intriguing things about tonight's panel is that this is an emerging field where uh, we're not even sure what all the issues are yet, you know, and uh, one thing that I particularly look forward to is the way in which uh, I know as a professional philosopher, one of the things I learned fairly early in my career when I began to do ethics is that you need to be out in the field and you need to listen to people who are actually doing it. I've been doing a lot of stuff about robotics, going to labs in Japan and elsewhere. And and the and without being there and listening to those from the ground up who know how to do this, uh, our discussions are often uh, distorted and um, and often riddled with misapprehension. So I look forward to being able to learn a lot from this evening's panel, and I ask you to join me in welcoming our first speaker, Lucian Miller. Okay. Uh, good evening. It looks like we got a pretty full house here. Uh, my name is Lucian Miller. As he said, I'm the CEO of Innovative Designs. Uh, by trade, I am an electrical engineer. I hold a commercial multi-engine pilot's license, flight instructor's license. I've been involved in aviation my entire life, and uh, I just love anything that flies. <laughs> and so it's, it's kind of a unique uh, privilege that I've made that in my career, and I consider myself very fortunate because of that. Today I'm going to be speaking about UAV ethics, uh, both the benefits and concerns. Um, there's, there's some certain public perceptions about UAVs that I want to go over with, but first I want to start out with a couple definitions of terms so you understand what we're talking about. When we talk about a UAV, we're talking about an unmanned aerial vehicle. And when we talk about a UAS, it's an unmanned aerial system. Now, an, a UAV is just the aircraft itself where the system is comprised of all of the components that it takes to operate, the aircraft, the operator, control station, telemetry gear, and in some cases even satellites for long range communications. There's one a very important thing to remember is there's nothing unmanned about unmanned aircraft. <laughs> there's always a pilot somewhere in the loop, always. So whenever you see a, you know, what we consider drones or anything, somewhere, someplace, on the ground or someplace is a pilot that can take control of that craft at any moment. Um, the media has been perpetuating the use of the term drone on a regular basis when they talk about UAVs and there's some certain you know, negative connotations associated with the term drone that are left over from uh, early unmanned aircraft that were used decades ago. Uh, the word drone is used, people immediately think of military applications of the technology and uh, people generally think that drones kill people and destroy property. That's the first thing that comes to mind when people think of that term. Um, recently, uh, did any of you guys see the uh, AUVSI president uh, talking on to Congress? They were having all kinds of UAV talks back about three or four weeks ago. Um, Michael Toscano attempted to no avail to try and explain to Senator Leahy that we're not talking about drones anymore. These are new systems that are completely different from stuff that you, you know we, that we've seen in the past. Uh, drones have been around for almost 100 years. One of the first ones here, the Kettering Bug, uh, was first flown in 1918. It was basically a torpedo with wings that could fly. It had a very crude uh, guidance system in it. It could fly about uh, 75 miles and when it reached its distance it would just pop the wings off and the torpedo would fall and blow up. So uh, drones, what most people don't understand, they have been around almost 100 years. Uh, this is a one that probably comes to mind. A lot of people uh, heard about the V-1 buzz bombs that were shot all over Europe during World War II. Uh, and this, this type of device put a lot of fear in people's hearts because they'd hear it coming and then it'd go quiet and then there'd be a big boom and you never knew quite where it was going to hit. So, you know, the, when, when people talk about drones, these are drones. Unmanned, unguided, completely autonomous, stupid vehicles that just go in a certain direction and fall and blow up. That's, that's where the word drone originally came from. Uh, some of the early shortcomings of drones was they had very limited guidance systems, uh, very crude timers for setting how far they flew. They basically had a propeller in the front that would spin. They'd count how many times it spun and knowing how fast it went, it went about 27 miles and then it would drop, you know. So uh, 
The other problem was there's no ability to recall the aircraft once it was launched. Once you fire that thing off, it's going until it runs out of gas or reaches its timeout point. There was a very high collateral damage potential with this kind of technology and a very high failure rate of the systems because, you know, we're talking back in the 40s, they were still pretty crude systems. They created a lot of fear in the public and gave a very bad name to the technology potential. Um, some of the modern day UAS systems that you've probably seen, the Global Hawk, uh, the Scan Eagle, the Predator Reaper, these are currently used today uh, by our military and these are, you know, what, when people think of drones today, this is what they think about. Uh, what we're doing now in the new UAV uh, technology is non-military uses. You know, it, prior to uh, the systems that are available today, the systems were just so expensive and so hard to maintain that only military budgets could afford them. You know, uh, the military used them for military purposes, you know, warfare. That's what they were designed and built to be used for. Uh, the modern systems are available now at a fraction of the cost of some of these early systems. Uh, and, and there's just so much more po uh, possible with modern systems. Uh, but before UAV systems can be accepted by the general public, they have to go through the six stages of technological acceptance. Every major advancement in world history has had to go through this, from the train to the automobile to the telephone. Everything goes through these six stages. And uh, when we talk about the six stages of technological acceptance, the first stage is ignorance. People are just totally unaware that the technology even exists. Ten years ago, how, how much talk about drones was there in the news? Virtually none. I mean, they've been operating since the first Gulf War on a regular basis, but you just never heard about them. Uh, the next stage that the things go into is denial. People hear about it and it's like, it's just like when cars came out. When, when, peop, when the first cars came out, nobody knew about it. Then when they did start coming out, people were like, oh man, I'm, I'm going to keep my horse. That, them stupid cars, that, them are never going to take off. You know, that's just, that's just silly. Well then you get into the, st the third stage, which is fear and anger. This is a point where people don't understand the technology and they overreact to it. That's where we are right now with UAVs and drones. This is the stage in the automobile where people said, oh, you're never going to be able to drive over 20 miles an hour, your lungs are going to collapse and you'll die at the wheel and all of this kind of stuff. I'm sure we've all heard all those kind of stories. Once people get over the fear and anger, they reach a point of acceptance where people be actually begin to see the use of the technology and how it could be of a benefit. We're sort of teetering right now between the fear and anger and the acceptance stage in different areas of UAV technology. Then you get to the point of understanding where a light bulb goes off and they go, oh wow, I can actually see how this could be useful. You know, this, this is really cool. And once you get to that stage, you get to the level of enthusiasm where people actually see it, use it, and they start telling other people about it. Just like in the automobile, people bought a car and thought, wow, this is great. This is much better than driving in a horse and buggy. And then they start telling all their friends about it. And that's where it gets into the enthusiasm stage. And once you hit that point, then the technology becomes accepted. It becomes part of the mainstream of society. The, the new emerging technology in UAS is uh, a lot of new smaller systems have been developed in recent years and the cell phone industry you know everybody's carrying around one of these smartphones now it's the sensors in these cell phones that are made on the order of billions now the accelerometers and the GPS antennas and the uh, gyroscopes and all the sensors that are in those phones are now being used in the UAVs on a, on a grand scale many small UAV systems are available for under a thousand dollars like the ones that you see on the table in the back of the room some of those depending on the options you get are in, you know, thousand to fifteen hundred dollars. In fact, the one you see pictured there, the Parrot AR drone is available at Brookstone stores all over the country for three hundred ninety-nine dollars. You fly it with your cell phone. It's got a little camera in it, and you can see the image on your phone and fly it around in your yard. And you know, it, the the technology has gotten to the point where you know, for under four hundred dollars, you can own it. Uh, some of the new uses for technology. Uh, Life-saving efforts. Uh, some of you may have heard back on May 6th of this year, up in uh, Saskatchewan, Canada, there was a gentleman who drove off the side of the road, his car flipped, went in a snowbank, he was ejected from the vehicle, and uh, in the process, his shoes came off, he didn't have a coat on, so here he is out in the snow in freezing weather, he still had a cell phone in his pocket, so he called the, you know, the 911 you know, in Canada and said, hey, I've flipped my car over, you know, can you come help me? They send the Royal Canadian Mounted Police out after him. Well, they get there, 
They find the car, but the guy's nowhere to be found. Well, it just so happened that that car that arrived had one of the new Dragonfly X4 multi-rotor systems. And this is the same size as the one I have in the back of the room. And if you'll notice, it's equipped with an infrared vision system hanging underneath it. They were able to put this craft up in the air, and within two minutes, they found a white hot spot in the dirt right there, which was the guy uh, huddled up at the base of a tree. This is an actual frame from the video that they shot with that, that camera. And the, the Royal Canadian Mounties were able to run over, grab this guy. He was curled up in a ball, unresponsive, passed out from hypothermia. And they were able to rush him to the hospital, warm him up, and save his life. So b because of this technology, you know, you, you've got a lot of life-saving potential. You know, we've got search and rescue, infrastructure inspection, agricultural inspection, endangered species protection, all kinds of different uh, systems that, are, uh, that these, these can be used for. Uh, I'm just going to go through these real quick. You know, search and rescue, the Coast Guard can use this technology to drop uh, needed support for people. Uh, you can use power line and pipeline inspections. Uh, agricultural inspections for maintaining uh, views of, of uh, agricultural fields and how to apply your fertilizers and stuff in a very uh, needed way without over fertilizing or anything. Uh, endangered species protection. Uh, the WWF is currently researching the, this technology to help uh, with the black rhino poaching issues. It's been on the rise up to as many as 500 in a year and so with only 5,000 rhinos remaining they're going to be extinct by the end of this decade if we don't do something. Uh, for public safety, you can restore a telephone service with, with a system to an area that's been devastated by a hurricane. Uh, Border Patrol and Forest Services can use this technology to find forest fires and uh, stop illegal activities on the borders. And then for perimeter security, for things like the San Onofre plant, you can keep an eye on things and make sure that everything uh, is, is good there. So uh, getting to the end here, uh, uh, tremendous benefits can be achieved through this technology. The public must be educated to uh, understand it. Uh, with education, the fear will diminish. Uh, responsible use of the technology is an absolute must for us to go forward with it. And the benefits and usefulness of this technology will save both money and lives in the future. But uh, intelligent regulations need to be put in place in order to provide for the public safety. So looking to the future, I think that this technology has a, a lot of potential to be used to save lives, money, and all kinds of great stuff. So uh, thank you very much. Well, you know, I don't know about the rest of you, but uh, I'm on that last stage of uh, enthusiasm where, you know, I want to go out there and soup up my UAV. So, you know, there. Uh, I hope you like uh, some of the uh, slides that he shared with you. Those are most of the products that my company produces. So uh, hopefully you'll, you'll enjoy them. Um, getting back to, uh, getting right down to ethics. I mean, one of the biggest concerns right now, you, you probably read about it, you hear about it on television, you see it in, in different news articles, is the issue about privacy. Personal privacy, um, as it relates to UAVs, um, is something it's, I think the, the media is responsible for making this uh, more of a circus than it needs to be. Um, but let me, let me step back and say that, first of all, if you're concerned about privacy, your personal privacy, especially in your homes, you should be. Um, there is a, a real privacy uh, you know, issue with this technology because like any new technology that uh, suddenly uh, is readily available and certainly with smaller aircraft uh, like the ones that, uh, like the AR Parrot drone is a, is a very good example. Um, you know, this, this can be bought for, for a very small price, the $400 that, that Lucia mentions, and anybody and everybody can operate it. You can spy on your neighbor, you can uh, take off from your, your side of the fence and, and fly right up to his bedroom window and, you know, have a good time. Um, those are the concerns that most people have. What the public is not really aware of is the fact that this privacy issue goes back a long ways. It goes back to the 50s and 60s. I mean, there have been legal debates, um, court decisions that, that uh, address aerial surveillance. This is just, UAVs are just another form of aerial surveillance. And people shouldn't get too 
crazy about UAVs per se, but more about the limitations and legislation that ought to be brought to bear to regulate aerial surveillance, you know, especially with regards to, uh, you know, the Fourth Amendment uh, rights that you have as individuals. You know, this, uh, in particular, this addresses, um, you know, your, your right to privacy, um, you know, your right to, uh, you know, you know to, to be protected from unlawful uh, search and seizure, you know. Uh, this is the, the, the amendment that uh, forces the police department to get a warrant when they want to uh, search something in, on your property, in your house. Um, there are so many legal uh, issues going on uh, in the background that, that people aren't aware of. Um, it's, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it, goes, it, it goes far, far deeper than, than uh, you know, than, than UAVs. The, the issue has to do with the way the technology is employed. It's not the technology itself and what it can do, but it's how it's used. And these are the kind of things that you need to be aware of and, and be concerned about. Um, Personally, I'm completely, uh, you know, uh, in support of any legislation that is going to restrict the information that you can gather with UAVs. And really, that's what it's all about. It's what kind of information can a UAV collect, you know, in, in, in the way that it's used. Um, you know, and how, how do you, as, as the general public, protect yourself? Um, you know, you need to get involved with your local politicians, uh, you know, at, at the county and state, as well as the federal level, and push for, for legislation that doesn't restrict the technology, but restricts the way it's employed. You know, make sure that it's employed for the right reasons. Because as Lucian pointed out, there are some fantastic benefits for UAVs. There's all kinds of life-enhancing, life-saving roles that UAVs can, can be employed uh, for. Um, because they, they do so many of these jobs at a fraction of the cost of manned aircraft. And, and they, you know, the, the, the risk to, to human life is mitigated. Uh, you know, you're not risking pilots and personnel. Uh, people on the ground, it's, it's, it's amazing technology and, and it should go forward. But one of the things that uh, you're probably not aware of is that um, up until probably I think uh, the early 40s, um, there was uh, some laws in place that protected the airspace above your private property. You had the right to control what went on in the airspace above you. But then as aviation grew, transportation, air transportation grew, and obviously we, we can't uh, have airliners zipping around trying to avoid every house on the, on the block. You know, that's not going to work. So the federal government, uh, you know, enacted legislation to basically take away that right to, the, to the, your privacy over your property. You no longer today have any real control over the airspace over your property. However, having said that, there are laws in place. There are there are tort, there's tort law that addresses your privacy concerns, your right to to personal privacy on your own, in, you know, within your home and on your property. And you should, uh, you know, as as uh, as responsible citizens, learn about it. You know, uh, take the take the time to study the law, find out what's uh, what's involved, what rights you really have, what recourse you have, um, and you should, you know. Uh, get involved in, in the local government and do something about it. But don't make the mistake of trying to restrict the technology because the technology isn't evil. The technology isn't the problem. It's the people who use it and how they use it. But every day there's satellites up above you every single day that can read the, the name tag on your, on your kid's shirt you know, at school through the window of that classroom. I mean, it's that uh, pervasive, you know, but how that uh, information is used is is what this is all about. So um, now, what are some of the ways that uh, you know that that um, would restrict naturally restrict uh, the way this technology is used? There are things that that sort of uh, restrict it already from a commercial standpoint. Those of us who are in the business of producing, you know, designing, producing, and selling this technology uh, are not the bad guys. You know, we. Uh, see the the benefits. We see uh, some of the um, uh, tremendous uh, commercial potential uh, that a lot of people, including the media industry, would really love to have uh, a lot more free, a lot freer use of, of uh, such small UAVs for for news gathering purposes. Um, 
I have uh, been in conversations with uh, several uh, charitable organizations, uh, one in particular, the uh, Samaritan's Purse uh, back on the East Coast. They do a lot of work uh, worldwide uh, with uh, disaster relief and humanitarian aid effort. And they think that uh, UAVs uh, provide a fantastic uh, means of, of helping people in uh, disaster situations. You know, when, when the uh, tornado hit, uh, uh, you know, not too long ago in Oklahoma, I wished we would had our team there with, uh, with some of our rotary wing uh, aircraft because we could have lifted sensors that would have aided, uh, you know, the... Uh, uh, you know, the search parties on the ground in finding people buried under rubble. I mean, uh, wouldn't you like to, if you were one of those individuals trapped in, in such a situation, wouldn't you want somebody to be able to bring to bear whatever technology was there to, to save your life? I mean, it's life-saving technology, it really is. Um, one of the, uh, you know, ways that uh, we would employ the technology, in particular our company, is focused on um, providing time-saving, uh, you know, uh, delivery of life-critical uh, supplies, like medical supplies to remote areas. You know, um, one of the, you know, we're, we're trying to do some work with the Canadian government to, uh, you know, to give us a chance to operate on a particular route between a major city, uh, an outlying airport at a major city and a remote uh, town or village, you know, up near the, the Arctic Circle uh, because of the weather considerations. UAV, a fixed wing UAV that can carry a considerable uh, payload of life-saving medical supplies as an example, um, can operate in weather that would ground manned aircraft. Uh, I've had conversations with some of the US Coast Guard personnel that I know, um, and they've described to me many instances where I could have operated one of our UAVs uh, in a search and rescue effort offshore, uh, or to drop uh, critical supplies to, to save someone's life on, on a foundering vessel at sea, they couldn't get out there because the weather was so bad. But, you know, if you have a, a multi-million dollar aircraft with a crew of four or five or six uh, crew members, you know, and, and you've got uh, life-threatening weather conditions for that aircraft, you know, but you had a UAV that could go out and, and uh, be launched uh, immediately and take the same equipment and do the same job for a fraction of the cost of that, uh, that large manned aircraft, you wouldn't hesitate to use it, would you? I mean, it's... Uh, you know, it's a, it's a small price to pay uh, if, if, uh, if the machine can get the job done. But one of the things that, that um, would, you know, that would allay some of your fears is the fact that the FAA is going to regulate the use, the commercial use of UAVs. We can't do anything, we in the industry can't do a whole lot about um, people with their little AR parrot drones, you know, uh, operating over over your you know your fence, you know we can't stop your neighbors from spying on you uh, with that sort of thing. You're just going to have to call the police and, and have them arrested. But, um, we can certainly regulate the operation of UAVs from a commercial standpoint, and by making those requirements in order to get certification to operate as a commercial entity, uh, which by the way is no different than that of uh, you know, a, a, a commercial charter operation or an airline, this is, you know, these requirements uh, could be put in place for all of us uh, commercial operators of UAVs, and that would effectively eliminate all the, you know, the, the kids and, and uh, you know, the people who, who really are not that serious about the, you know, employing the technology correctly. So, there you have it. <laughs> Uh, my name's Bob Osborne. I worked with LA County Sheriff for 38 years. Uh, since about 2007, 2008, I, I began to deal with unmanned uh, aircraft issues. And I'll just cut to the chase. The LA County Sheriff doesn't have any uh, unmanned aircraft. We made a decision to not purchase them because we can't get through the regulatory uh, requirements to be able to fly them. But we do want them, and once those regulatory issues um, uh, get resolved and we're, we're anxious to be able to, uh, to move forward. Uh, let me give you a couple of disclaimers here. Oop, there's three of them. Um, everything I share with you is my opinion. It's not the sheriff, it's not uh, the police department, any of the companies, committees, it's not my church, it's just Bob. And uh, Bob was invited to come and share with you and so you get Bob instead of a representative of some other uh, place. I, have, I always joke with people that I have a, an opinion about everything, but I may not be right. And I, I really like that concept because we all show up at something like this with opinions. 
and thoughts and paradigms and you know the way we see things. And what I hope to do today is to give you a very thoughtful paradigm, a thoughtful way of thinking about how public safety might be able to use uh, unmanned aircraft systems. We always call it UAS because I don't care as much about the airplane as what the airplane does uh, for me, the, the, the data that, it, that it'll provide for me. But uh, I hope that, that I'll come across as very thoughtful about the process and the issues and the challenges we face because that's actually who I am. Uh, trying to be very thoughtful, very systematic, and, and very aware of, of the issues we face. And then I've always found in my life that some of my best learning uh, occurs after I've already formed my opinion. And then I hear other people talking about stuff and I go, oh, I hadn't thought of that. So I hope as we engage in our conversation here over the next hour or so that uh, that will be what happens. Tonight, uh, we're going to look at uh, just a couple things, an overview of likely uses for unmanned aircraft systems. I'm going to speak primarily from what I call the state local uh, policing, law enforcement, public safety, fire kind of a perspective. And then the second part we'll talk about some concerns about uh, unmanned aircraft systems being used by government. And there are lots of them and I hope that I hit all of them in the 10 minutes I have which is approximately one minute per slide for those of you who are keeping score. So uh, potential uh, public safety uses. There's first a few observations and opinions. I, I, and th this is very personal thought, just looking at what's been going on over the last years. But I really think that collectively, manufacturers probably overstate the demand for use of UAS by public safety agencies. Because frankly, an unmanned aircraft system is just another tool. It's like our cars, our guns, our bullets, uh, tasers, uh, you know, CAD system, computer, uh, com I, I'm not supposed to use acronyms, computer assisted dispatch systems, computers, and it's just another tool that we'd like to have in our toolbox. And so there really isn't a requirement that we get it. There's no keep up with the Joneses that says all police departments, oh, we really need to get out and get that. There's 18,000 police departments in the United States. Currently, just over 300 of them have any kind of manned uh, air assets, okay? So 17,700 of them have no air support unless they borrow it from somebody else. That's probably where the market is. Most of the uh, market uh, for UAS technologies, uh, I, I think, is going to be in the private sector, uh, not uh, by government. Um, when you're talking about inspecting pipelines and electrical wires and crops and you know all those other things, I really think at the end of the day that the companies that are banking on making a profit by selling this stuff to government are making a marketing mistake. That the big market for unmanned aircraft system is going to be in the private sector, not in the government sector. The current crop of uh, UAVs, uh, most of them were designed and fashioned for the military. As such, most of the ones that I've seen uh, and I don't mention any of them by name uh, very strategically, but most of the ones that I've seen are way over-engineered for what we need in public safety, which means they cost way too much money, and they're, they're just, they're just not, not something that's really viable for, uh, for immediate purchase for small police departments, medium-sized police departments all over the country. So I don't think we're going to see a rush of police departments running out there buying stuff until some of these devices get re-engineered. I'm encouraged by some of the smaller, more uh, what I consider more practical for local agency and local uh, business person use technologies that's beginning to get into the ballpark that will be useful for us. And then uh, the anticipated operational restrictions imposed by the FAA are going to severely limit the potential scope. And let me give you just a couple of the things that they're constantly being changed, but among the things that are being you know, batted around are things like you can't fly higher than 400 feet. You can't fly, uh, fly further away than the pilot can see it. You think about that on a smoggy, you know, Los Angeles kind of a day. Uh, I may go, you know, over the block and it's time to come back. Um, what are some of the other ones? Uh, we have to have a pilot flying the aircraft, an observer watching the aircraft, and then operationally I need someone to tell me what they're seeing. So every time we would deploy one, I need three more people than I currently deploy not having one of those things. So there's just a lot of stuff like that. Uh, one, of the, one of the classics is that whenever all of the approvals that I'm aware of that the FAA has given, one of the little clauses says that if there's a, a manned aircraft in the vicinity that you have to land your uh, unmanned aircraft. I don't know of any event in Los Angeles County where we would want to fly one of these things that a media helicopter is not going to show up. You know, so what, what am I going to do? And so there's just a lot of regulatory um, issues that need to be faced by the FAA. I do a fair amount of flying uh, in my life on commercial uh, airliners and I can tell you I do not want to be knocked out of the sky by some, you know, funky police department or fire department or search and rescue squads, unmanned aircraft 
that doesn't pass muster. Okay, so I'm a big supporter of the FAA coming up with some realistic restrictions so that we can integrate this technology. But that's just something else that's holding it back. Potential public safety uses, I divided law enforcement, fire service, and search and rescue. It's a little bit arbitrary, search and rescue, fire and police agencies, you know, both do that kind of stuff. I've always maintained that if a community really wanted to get these things, you'd have the fire department ask for it because everyone loves the firemen and uh, not everyone loves the police department. But uh, for law enforcement, the type of stuff, this is the stuff that I hear in the, in, the, in the public safety sector. This is what people are talking about using unmanned aircraft for. Tactical operations like SWAT team uh, kind of stuff, area searches for suspects hiding in backyards. Uh, when you think about what's the alternative, wouldn't it be nice from a policing perspective if I've got a suspect that I think I have cornered in a large backyard to fly a small unmanned aircraft with an infrared sensor that can tell me where that person is? And if the public says, no, you can't do that, then what is my alternative? My alternative is probably to send a dog uh, to find them, and that's a nasty uh, scenario, or to send an armed tactical team uh, into that backyard. And what happens when we do that? We end up with shoot. We don't want to kill people. We don't want to have gunfights. We don't want canines to you know, find uh, bad guys hiding in bushes and stuff. And so that's, that's the type of thing where you know, this would be really beneficial to us if it was something that was in fact in our tool chest. One of the things that we don't talk, well let me talk about crowd and traffic control. If you've ever, uh, I know I have many a time been the incident commander for large scale um, you know, uh, public events and that kind of stuff. And it is really hard to understand what the crowd dynamic is, where people, can, if something goes wrong, where are we going to send people? Uh, it's really hard to understand that while you're sitting inside a trailer. Uh, someplace. It is a real blessing to be able to see a, a visual image of, of what's down there below you. We call that situational awareness. It's a way that we understand if something goes wrong or when something goes wrong, what is it that we want people to do? How will we send, uh, say, rescue squads in? How do we get people out of an area? And so that's, a, that's a, a, a very large potential use. Think of football games and, you know, those kinds of events. Traffic collision, crime scene documentation, you don't hear about that very often. But every once in a while, you'll have one of those 15 vehicle collisions that shuts down an interstate highway. Uh, police departments, highway patrol, we have to diagram it, measure it, do all kinds of stuff. One of the most important things for us to have is some kind of visual representation that shows how all these vehicles and evidence and stuff uh, lies in proximity to others and, and you know, just kind of how they're laid out on the ground. We can send one of these things up, snap a few pictures, and we're done. And we can move everything off the side of the road and get the road open. If we have to bring out the, you know, the laser stands and the triangulation stuff, we'll be there for two or three hours. And again, I mean, that would be really nice to be able to open the road. My understanding is that the Utah Highway Patrol uh, has a number of these for that purpose, and they love it, and so do the people in Utah. Fire service, just real briefly, wildfires. Uh, firemen always like to know where the hot spots are. Uh, infrared technology is really good for that. Structure fires, if, uh, how, many how many of you remember a month or so ago, I forget what city it was, I wished I'd remember that for this uh, event, but uh, several firemen were killed when they fell through the roof, trying to punch holes to ventilate a fire. Uh, that's probably one of the most dangerous things a fireman does, is get on a roof and try to poke holes to, to ventilate this thing, because they don't know what's going on underneath. Uh, small unmanned aircraft, you could fly that from the trunk of your car over, take an infrared photo, and you can see where the hot spot is, and you know I don't want guys standing on that hot spot. Let's you know, move them over to another place so that uh, they can uh, punch a hole. Explosions and fire response. Uh, one of the people on this uh, uh, Homeland, Department of Homeland Security uh, steering committee I'm on is the uh, fire marshal for the state of Oklahoma. And we've had some fascinating discussions about tornado response in rural America, but also the Oklahoma City bombing. Remember when the Murrah Federal Building was, uh, was blown up? Uh, people in Oklahoma, now that they've seen this, uh, this technology and what it can do, are absolutely convinced that they could have saved more lives if they could have flown a small unmanned aircraft up floor by floor to look horizontally into the into the structure to see where survivors might be. Uh, they're convinced that while they stood on the ground just wondering how can we you know, figure out where people might be in this building that people died. And so there's some very real search and rescue uh, potentials or, uh, for explosion fire response. Search and rescue, communications relay, we talked about damage assessments, the number one thing that we have to do when that eight point gazillion earthquake hits 
in Southern California, the first thing your public safety agencies have to do is damage assessment. It's not rescue people. It's damage assessment. Figure out where to go because there just aren't enough of us. And this is a wonderful tool when the airport is closed. You know, we're not, when the runways are buckled, we're not flying. So um, that's a, a very good use of the tool. Concerns, there are two primary ones, safety and, and privacy. I talked briefly about safety. This idea of integrating into the national airspace, obviously we need to be able to have the aircraft take off and land in a fairly predictable, uh, predictable manner. Anywhere where police and fire departments go creates a crowd. And uh, if, if, if it's gonna take, you know, 100 yards uh, forever to land, you know, uh, and you might miss it by 15%, that might be problematic. Airworthiness, the skill of the pilot, all those kinds of things. I wanna jump into privacy very briefly. Uh, California Constitution, uh, Article 1, Section 1, the last sentence, among these are enjoying, defending life, liberty, acquiring, possessing, protecting property, and pursuing and obtaining safety, happiness, and privacy. Privacy is a constitutional right in the state of California. There are, in fact, all kinds of exceptions. It's not an absolute right, just like free speech is not an absolute right. Uh, but it is a constitutional right in the state of California that has to be respected by government agencies that might want to use this technology. The Fourth Amendment talks about searches and seizures. It doesn't care about your neighbor's search, but it's all about government search. And we've been governed by search and seizure law forever. And, uh, you, you know, it constantly changes. It's constantly modified. The appellate court, Supreme Court, are constantly coming up with five to four decisions and nuancing that over the years, and I expect that once unmanned aircraft are used, that we'll see some more of those things. I always like to say that our nation was founded upon distrust of strong, intrusive government. And so I understand when the community says, I'm not sure I want the police or, you know, to have this stuff. I understand that. That's how America was founded. Sir Robert Peel, way back, uh, founder of uh, modern policing, if you can say that, way back in the uh, early 1800s in London, among his principles, was this portion says the police are the public and the public are the police, the police being only members of the public who are paid to give full time attention to duties which are incumbent on every citizen in the interest of community welfare and existence. The police are not special people, we're people like everything else. The only thing that's different is that we get paid to give full time attention to uh, issues of welfare and safety and, and uh, uh, compliance with law, uh, responsibilities that every, every citizen has. The public has the right to decide how they're going to be policed. If a community doesn't want to have unmanned aircraft, there's no reason for them to have it. Uh, again, this is just another tool. Uh, the public has a right to decide what capabilities their police will or will not have. The public could decide that we don't want the cops to have cars. That's, you know, that's their right. Then we'll all walk. But for all of those decisions, there's a consequence to them. So every time we say we don't want law enforcement to have that cap this capability because we're afraid of A, consequences B, C, and D are likely going to be there. And so I go back to that, you know, doing an area search. If you don't want me to use this technology, that's okay. We still have to look for the bad guy, and it, it just becomes a more, risky, um, uh, a more risky process for us. Typically, the concern is not the aircraft. No one cares about the aircraft other than its aerodynamics and the fact that it'll deliver my payload to where I want it to be in an effective way. But he, these are the issues that I really think the public needs to come to grips with. What can be stored? What images can be stored? What data can be stored? For how long? Under what circumstances? What's a public uh, record and what is uh, private? If uh, at a SWAT team, a hostage barricade thing, I, I, I get to fly uh, aircraft from say two blocks away where it's safe and I go over two homes to get to the suspect's house. Do I have to get a warrant for the two homes I passed? Which the, one of the more recent pieces of legislation I saw in California would have required that. It's like, I don't know who to serve that warrant on. Uh, you know, I could, I'm not certain, but you know, I, I would just be incidentally seeing something en route to a place where I need to be, where I have all kinds of uh, exceptions, and even for those exceptions, we're still getting warrants for those kinds of things. Um, do we need judicial pre-approval, or can we respond like it's an emergency, and then go back and have the judiciary actually approve what we did, or, or say, no, you did it wrong, and exclude it? Um, I don't talk about what the federal government does. Um, they, they're every time the federal government says we're police like you are, I just smile because they're not. Um, one of the things I always do is recommend that there's local control. I, I, don't, I don't want uh, Washington, D.C. 
uh, telling my town in uh, Southern California what we can and cannot do in terms of our local policing. Closing thoughts. I think these are important as we engage in rational, thoughtful discussion, is that we typically want justice for the other guy, but mercy for us. Okay, I, that came really true to me in 1992 when we had the uh, riots in Los Angeles and the slogan painted on all the walls was no justice, no peace. And I got to thinking, it really got me to thinking that, you know, I, I want justice too, but I tend to want it for the other guy. I, if, I, if I do something wrong, I want mercy. Um, we want the police to catch the other guy, but we want to get away. Anybody been stopped for a traffic ticket? <laughs> Anybody been happy another guy got stopped? You know, the idiot who, you know, and he stopped, and you're, yeah! But when the lights are on behind you, it's like, oh man, I hope he lets me get away. <laughs> if we want public safety people like Bob to connect the dots, we have to have dots to connect, okay? If, if, if public safety agencies can't collect data, things will happen and it'll always be a surprise. And so I just remember from 9-11, uh, 2001, this, this great clamoring to connect dots. And it's like, well, there's all kinds of dots out there. Not all dots connect. And uh, none of the dots are numbered. And so um, if you want us to connect dots, we have to have some data that consists of dots that we're, we're able to collect. And in general, one of the things I found in the dialogue is, is uh, that the goals of privacy advocates and public safety officials have a lot more in common than we do differences. Most of the differences are just in degree. But the basic principles of privacy and safety and, and compliance with the law and uh, you know, not having a helicopter following me around everywhere I go, we have a lot in common. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I'd like to begin with a question about the three stages, Lucian. Uh, but this is a question for the entire panel. Uh, but s you presented that so, so clearly and well. And as I was listening, I was thinking, well, this is the, these are the, I'm sorry, the six stages for uh, the development of acceptance of a technology. But I, I had two thoughts. One is sometimes the technologies actually don't get accepted. You know, and, and I, and I think of nuclear power and the, and the difficulties surrounding that. But the other thing, between stages three and four, it seems there's often a regulatory stage that begins to emerge and, and pervades those remaining three. So if you think about something like driving and the automobile, you know, when it, when it began, some places there, there were requirements that someone walk ahead of you with a lantern saying that you were coming, you know? That also gives you some idea of the speed of those original cars. Uh, so I'd, I'd like you to speak to that issue of regulation, and I will move to the side and leave it Well, that, that also becomes a cyclical pattern as well, because we all know, you know, the cars came out, and when the cars first came out, they didn't have things like seat belts in them, and they didn't have things like airbags in them, and then after, P and, they, and the windshields were just glass. And after enough people, you know, got injured, they decided we need, we need plastic in the windshield so it doesn't break, and we need seat belts so people don't go flying through the windshields, and we need airbags so that, you know, people don't end up, you know, getting banged around. So the, the regulation, a lot of times, it, 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 it comes in cycles as the technology develops. And, and all, all technologies, you, you know, you'll see that in. Just like in, in our homes and our children, you know, we have all this child baby safety stuff. Now I have, you know, two little toddler grandsons and we're having to baby proof our house. Mm -hmm. And you got stuff you stick in the baby gates and stuff you stick in the outlets and all this kind of stuff. That's all come about because of the emerging technology and as it develops you're always going to see stuff like that follow on later on. Could, could I just add uh, a thought to that? You know we talk about the car, that's my favorite story is the lanterns and people running in front of the car because we have to save the horse. Uh, you know, make sure that we don't do anything to hurt the horse and buggy economy. But one of the things that has changed is that in, the, in terms of the regulatory environment is that we are long past uh, that stage where we would tolerate having the equivalent of uh, glass pane windows and no seat belts and all that kind of stuff in an, even an emerging technology. Our ability to uh, safely and sanely uh, realistically integrate new technologies into the world has grown significantly since the early 1900s. And yet we still see, I think emotionally, we still have those same kind of visceral uh, reactions to new things that pop up that I'm uncomfortable with. I still have to go through all six of those things, but our safety, uh, our, our safety parameters for integration of things like that is a lot more robust today than it was in the 1900s, early 1900s. 
Hello, uh, my name is Andrea. I'm not categorically against drones. I know the CEO of PETA, Ingrid Newkirk, is uh, planning on using them to uh, catch illegal poachers and things like that. And um, one, of, one of my friends has a metaphor that I think applies. He says, if your train is on the wrong track, every station is the wrong station. And um, I'm concerned that the technology, no disrespect, is a little bit dinosauric. It's a little bit um, materialistic. It's not really solving any real problems. And the people from that I go to college with are going to go into careers like that that are really just robotics, materialistic. You know, even even the the highest form of robotics, like the Cassini spacecraft that left Cape Canaveral in 1997, it took seven years to get to Saturn, and it's doing wonderful things, taking pictures. But if we're going to be reverse engineering anything, it probably needs to be UFOs or something. <laughs> well, one, one of the things that we uh, have addressed, I had to kind of rush through the last part of my slides, but the, the WWF is currently using this technology in South Africa in an effort to stop the poaching of the black rhinos and the elephants and the tigers and things there. Because with persistent surveillance from aircraft like this, they can not only maintain where the herd is, but they can also catch the poachers when they're still 10 or 15 <coughs> miles away coming towards the herd and send their assets to that point to interact you know, with the poachers and stop them in the process from poaching. And so by having this eye in the sky view with aircraft like this that only cost a few dollars an hour to operate on an ongoing basis, they can affordably use their assets where they're most needed and help prevent you know, uh, that very thing that you're concerned about. And that's one of the uses that we are actively working on with the government in Sudan right now yeah. to, uh, to develop a system that they can fly around and uh, actively search a whole game preserve in order to, to prevent that very thing. Can, can I share a couple, uh, just a couple real quick uh, examples of things in my career where I say, boy, I wish I had an unmanned aircraft now that I know what they are. 1989, I was the graveyard shift watch commander at the women's jail in, uh, up in the hills in East Los Angeles, 2,500 women behind bars. And I'm the highest ranking officer there. My phone rings on my fourth day, fourth day there. I can hardly find the kitchen. Okay, but the fourth day of that assignment, the phone rings, and one of our East LA station patrol guys says, Bob, there was a, a uh, chlorine gas explosion. There's a large chlorine gas cloud, and it's moving towards Civil Brand Institute. And I said, well, how long before it gets there? And he said, we guess about 20 minutes. Okay, so here's the question. What am I going to do with 2,500 women behind bars in 20 minutes? with a chlorine gas cloud coming. What I would have given for someone to have been able to send a sensor up in the sky and to figure out what really is in that plume, is it really that dangerous? Now 20 minutes might not have been enough time to pull that off realistically, but that was a scenario. We have in LA County, we have an Air Force in the Sheriff's Department. I think we have 13 helicopters, three fixed wing, and busy skies in LA. But uh, we have this thing we call late night, early morning, low clouds and fog. And our helicopters can't fly through that. But I can see 400 feet up in the sky. And we've got SWAT teams and barricades. And I, I would give anything to know what's in the backyard before I send a deputy sheriff back there. And I can't do it. Uh, the only thing I can do. And so there are what I try to do with, with people that are considering buying for public safety an unmanned aircraft, I, I say get rid of the idea of this is neat to have. It'd be fun to fly around, get rid of all those thoughts. What task do you need to do that you currently cannot do that that tool will enable you to do for the purpose of public safety? And if you can answer that question, that determines which of the aircraft you buy, what sensors you put in it, how much you're willing to spend, all of those kinds of decisions. But until you can answer that question, don't even get in the running to buy an unmanned aircraft because you'll probably use it incorrectly. Am I getting a high sign? Uh, you're getting, we have time for one more question that was in line Let's earlier. Take a quick, quick line. Okay. I'm confused on, uh, you keep saying one pilot, one aircraft, one time. But that's not what I understand that the Border Patrol is doing. Uh, they're not going for these extensive permits each time know, they're, they're flying doing. these things, are they? Uh, no, they, they are not. They have a COA that's specifically for that aircraft and their isolated areas where they don't have people in cities and all that stuff. They have a specific area. They do have specific time frames. It's just longer than one day. So it is possible in some of those remote areas to get 
uh, authorization for a longer period of time. Uh, it's not possible in Los Angeles County, and probably not in San Diego. Yeah, I doubt it. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, please join me in thanking our panelists for this evening. Thank you.